so that that we record. And feel free for those joining to introduce yourself in the chat. Okay, very good. And we are 928. And so we have a moment or two before getting started. How is the sound, Laura? Nice and clear for me. Great. Uh, um, if the sound is difficult for anyone, please let us know so we can check into it. Sounds great. Sounds great, Doc. I put a voice enhancer on so, you know, so, so my voice is, uh, sounds better than it usually does. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I just <laughs> you sound nice and clear uh, to me. Nice, good, uh, distinct sound. <clears throat> Dominique, I know everybody else can hear, but I'm, I'm using, I have this new desktop that is actually electronic, raise it up and lower it down. And so today is my first day of using it where I'm able, actually able to stand up and, and present. Oh, that's nice. Great for the speaking voice being upright. Right. Instead of sitting down for however long we're going to be talking. I'll be <laughs> It's better for my health too. I've been sitting too long for this during this pandemic. Yes, you and me both. What do you mean? I made February the month. Like this is the month where I'm going every day to do something, get closer to that athletic goal, right? So taking the stairs, I'm trying right. to do little milestones, those little steps. <laughs> and then Laura, I'll just lean to you. Um, and you just let us know when you're ready to kick it off and we'll go okay, from there. Okay, very good. We're at 9.30 exactly. Uh, do you want to wait one more minute in case anyone can nope, know 9.31? I think we are good to go. So uh, um, welcome everyone. I know that there's some familiar faces today. I'm Laura Bucko with the CTE Industry Engagement Team. And uh, we're very excited to have you here as part of our PD session this morning. This is going to be on social and emotional learning, which is a topic I always want to hear about. I know that's something that you're addressing with your students. So I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Thomas to get us started. Okay. Laura, I'll start. I'll do it. Oh, you go ahead, Dominique. All right. Thank you very much. I'm handing this over to Dominique to get us started. Yes, Laura and I were, we were on the phone last night for a while. So <laughs> again, everyone, hi. So happy to have all of you here. Uh, congratulations on this conference and being here. Um, I overheard the speaker this morning. It sounded like a real motivational expert. So I hope you guys are fired up and ready to go. We have such an exciting guest for you today. Um, we'll get to him in a second, but I just want you guys to take this opportunity to really learn and to grow. Uh, if you don't have a pen and a piece of paper or a laptop nearby, please go get one. The expert that you're gonna hear from today is one of the top in the world. So 
He's going to be instilling a lot of information on you today. So I really hope you take this in. Again, grab that pen and a piece of paper, grab some water. We're gonna get started here in a second. Also, if you don't already, please feel free to uh, follow on LinkedIn or any social media pages. I'm Dominique Murphy, Dr. Dwayne Thomas, or Doc as I like to call him, as he affectionately goes by, uh, will be on those platforms as well. So today's topic, as you know, is social and emotional learning helping CTE students excel inside and outside the classroom. So first, we need to define what SEL is, social and emotional learning. It's the process of helping, uh, it's the process through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships and make responsible decisions. I am joined by one of the highest regarded experts in the world on this topic. Dr. Dwayne Thomas is coming to us today, making time out of his busy, busy, busy schedule. I called him and I begged him and I said, we need your expertise on this panel. So he is here graciously taking his time to be a part of this today. To give you his background, I'm gonna give you the Cliff Notes version because it's very extensive. We'd be here for probably half an hour with all the accolades he has received, but he is a professional scholar, practitioner, and leader with more than 30 years of experience crafting creative, innovative, and sustainable solutions in organizational leadership and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Programs in education as well as business, including program assessment, evaluation, and accreditation, social and emotional learning, deconstruction of systemic racism, promotion of anti-racist systems and sports-based youth development. Some of his highlights include, he is the current MSAA and MIAA DEI committee chair, the lead coach for United Way, SEL coach training and supervision, director of training and professional development programs and services in Africa, Central and South America, and the Caribbean. Whew. So without further ado, let's bring up Doc to the stage. Hi, Doc. Hey, Dominique. Hey, thank you very much. Woo woo. Let, raise it up. I don't. I don't hear anybody over there. Can, it, it, maybe my 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 sound is, is not so good. They're on me that you can speak. Okay. So cool. So well, it's it's my honor to be here to be able to speak with you all today. I started my career as a health and physical education teacher, so I know from whence you come. And hopefully, the comments and things that I am about to share with you today will um, move you in the direction of uh, understanding. And 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 I won't assume that you don't know about SCL because if you've been working in education for however long, then most everybody has had some impact and some influence around um, social and emotional learning. And so, so it's great to be able to be here today. And I am hoping that this is, an, it, since we have about 30 people or so, that we can really make this an interactive session. So please do, if you have questions as I'm speaking, make sure that you send those into the chat It'll put those, post those in the chat. Uh, both Laura and Dominique will be monitoring those things. And I will also um, take time out to, to stop from, from my comments to make sure that if there are questions that we are actually having more of an engagement. So I really do want you, after I've shared a few things, then to please do, if you have questions about things that I've shared, then please do uh, share those questions in the chat and also have time towards the end uh, for question and answer as well. And so um, if, if that's good in terms of intro, then uh, so my screen is being shared now. So hopefully everyone can see my screen and please do uh, take, take I, I try to make it so there was as few notes uh, as possible. I mean, even though there, there's quite a bit that I wanna share with you um, and so again, we'll have time for question and answer at the end. Okay. And so, so as an educator, and, and I, I don't know if all of you do this, but this is one of the things that I like to do anytime that I get started in a presentation like this, especially around professional development and learning, is to ask people to do an assessment of themselves. So where are all of you as you're thinking about SEL 
and the how we can integrate SEL with the things that you're doing in CTE. And so are you coming from a place of, you know, be, you know, if you look at the challenge pit, are you coming from a place of a learning challenge where this is maybe something that's new for you? Is this a performance challenge where maybe you've got experience with SEL and integrating SEL into your program? So it's it's how you know looking at it and saying how am I, am I able to do my best, or as you are you coming at it from an aspirational place where you know may I'm I'll be able to do this one day, and so you you have an interest in it and you really want to take it forward into your learning settings and environment, or is it a downhill challenge where you know, it, it doesn't stretch me or help me. And if it's one that, especially that last one, um, if you get to the end of this presentation and you're not feeling like you're being stretched and I haven't done my job. And so I, I need to really do know that because I need to make sure that it, it, we're gonna have a follow-up session as well today, but also make sure that I can share some information with some of you if I haven't pushed you uh, to a new limit. So think about that for a second. Which challenge pit are you in today? Learning challenge, performance challenge, aspirational challenge, or downhill challenge? And, uh, and hopefully you have some type of assessment like that with your students, because every day they come in with, a, they're in a new space and they should be in a new space when they come into your classroom. And so then we can look at some of what our, our learning objectives and goals are for today and, um, you know, so an overview of SEL and the necessity for SEL as a tool to support career and technical education, uh, excuse me, and as the, uh, the description for your conference said that this is, you guys are really there to get information to understand how you can be supportive of what's going on outside of the classroom, as well as supportive of all the things that are happening inside your classroom. And so I'm going to give you a number of things that look at both and how you as the instructional leader then can be the bridge between what young, young people are doing and what they have to experience outside the classroom, as well as then what they bring into your classroom because of those things that they experience outside of the classroom. And so we'll talk about a number of those things, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as a way for then you as the, as the instructional leader to be able to uh, bridge the gap for some of our young people. And so one of the first pieces that we have to look at is we have a new administration coming in and we have to understand all of the impacts and influences that are on you that are on parents, that are on communities, uh, your district leaders, um, and across the country. And so, with the new administration, you can see there's a number of factors that are going to, that impact education. And so, then the question becomes: How do we look at all of those things and then get all of that down to where our students are and how they and how we understand what environment they're coming in out of into your classroom and then how they're taking things back and forth as they move from outside your classroom to inside. And so we've got to understand all of these things. And so I'm not asking you today to, you know, it's beyond the scope of today's session to be able to hit on all of these pieces, but it's to understand the multiple vari multivariate approach to education and then to supporting the types of programs like yours and where does CTE fit on the national scope in terms of resources. So then, then the next piece is obviously we are right smack in the middle of the coronavirus global pandemic. The country has you know, supported the, you know, how we come out of you know, with the CARES Act and how we come out of this thing, but all of our students and all of you and every, everyone across the country is in this whole COVID-19 context. And, and we're experiencing all these challenges that have come on us in terms of how, how it's impacting you know, our classrooms, not being able to be in class, being virtual, virtual learning, you know, new phrases being created, you know, virtual fatigue, new things that students are having to deal with that, that, and that you're having to deal with that we never would have imagined that, that we would have to deal with. And so I post this information just so you get a snapshot of the types of places where resources are going and who's controlling those resources. 
because as a teacher, sometimes it's going to be on you, and you may have found this already, but on you to be able to then lead up and ask for some of the resources that maybe you know aren't, aren't reaching you, or to find out where those resources are and the type of timeline and things that would bring those resources into, into your classroom, into your districts and into your classroom. And so understanding the CARES Act, understanding the new changes that the Biden-Harris administration are bringing in and, and looking at those things and then saying, how do those factors impact learning? And so you can look at a number of the variables that, that are presented here, and we can look at all of them and say, a large part of it is systemic. And so systemically, we have to have the government who's you know, taking action and got, and with you guys in New York, you seem to have a, a progressive uh, governor who's, who's really been really responsive to the challenges and, 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 and the types of resources and making resources available. And then, so then it becomes beyond systemic, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. And so if we have, for example, and we're talking about social and emotional learning, but if we have, for example, the fact that we have people who are, you know, possibly going to be evicted and students are having to deal with that and they're coming to school with that instability um, impacting them. If there's any type of, so obviously with COVID, it's a public health crisis and challenge. And so again, students having to deal with that, their families having to deal with that. And maybe even some students having, being in parents who are having, who've been designated as essential. So they're having to go out, go to work, um, in the middle of this crisis and exposing themselves or, or and the risk. And then we can look at all of those things and one of those variables as we're moving around the circle is education. And how do we expect young people and how are young people able to grow, have a positive attitude to be ready to learn, willing to learn when all of these factors might be on them. And so it's really important that we understand that there's an, un so young people might be the healthiest in the world, but have underlying conditions that they are not in control of that they bring to the classroom. The fact that they're witnessing their parents having to struggle, for example, is an example of the types of things that young people experience that then they bring to the classroom setting, if not met in some type of way before they come to you. And so beyond those factors, we get to factors that actually affect students' performance. Some of these you probably have known, you've seen plenty of times, you know, you could look at it and say on, on a student factor side, individual educational and demographic factors. So where they're living, who they're living with, um, what is their, their social economic status, those types of things all impact young people and impact how people are ready to learn when they come to you. And then, you know, we're here talking about social and emotional learning. And so the lower, lower left-hand quadrant is, you know, behaviors, attitudes, and aspirations. Well, we, you all are in the position as career and technical educators to work with young people around their dreams. They're not able to reach their dreams if they come to you and all of these external factors are weighing so heavy on them. So then how did the, then you're having to deal with those things and they show up and show out in the middle of you trying to, to help them to reach their goals and to teach them. And that's why we have this piece around social and emotional learning and, and how important it is for the success of what's happening in your classroom. We can then look at the education factors. And so what are their previous educational experiences and successes? And what are some of the current programs, practices and supports that are in place for them to be successful? Well, unfortunately, and this is something that, I've, that I know and I'm sure most of you know as well as educators, there are too many things that are dumped on your plate. There are too many things that come from outside the classroom that then have an impact on what's happening inside the classroom. So then the question becomes, how do we mitigate those things? And that's part of why I say teachers as a bridge to from what's happening outside to what's going on inside, because someone, maybe parents aren't aware 
of all the things that are impacting their students and impacting their, their learning, or maybe they are not able to do very much about those things. So then students come to you and they're maybe, it might seem as if they are not ready to learn or not willing to learn or that they have a behavior problem. And, and that you know really is actually a, a misnomer and, and a label that maybe we shouldn't put on kids because they're not in control of these situations. If they're not in control of those factors and things, then it becomes necessary for us to put resources into uh, programs around social and emotional learning. And so one of the pieces that is an unfortunate consequence of what's been happening across our country is there was legislation that was passed, that was presented, excuse me, in 2015 that, that spoke to the importance of social and emotional learning and you know, so with the Academic Social and Emotional Learning Act of 2014. So the 114th Congress um, put forth these statements, statements that said things like social and emotional skills form a foundation for young people's success, not just in school, but as healthy and caring adults, productive workers and engaged citizens. Well, unfortunately that legislation didn't pass. And so that doesn't change the fact that it's still necessary and that the things that these legislators thought were important enough to present, to move forward just weren't important enough to, to support. And so now we have it that there are nonprofits like the United Way, there are you know, school districts are, are engaging um, and hiring you know, counselors, social workers who've had some experience working with young people to, to move into you know, SEL programming and staffing. And so we know that SEL program results in reduced problem behavior, improved health outcomes, a lower rate of violent delinquency, and a lower rate of heavy alcohol, alcohol use. And we also know that it has a great impact on what it is that young people are able to do in your classroom. And so as Dominique stated, you know, she, she, she provided a great example of what uh, social and emotional learning is by definition. And so there, the uh, Cassell, most of you and many of you may be familiar with Cassell. It's probably the, the world leading organization as it relates to social and emotional learning. And so <clears throat> after 26 years in 2020, the Cassell organization updated its definition of social and emotional learning. And so by in that update, they make mention of that, of course, SEL is an integral part of education and human development, that the SEL is the process through which you know, young people and adults acquire, apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop health, healthy identities and everything else that Dominique mentioned. The key piece there, for me at least, is understanding that the adults piece can't be understated. The end, Typically, if we have and, and have a, a young person that comes and maybe they're not ready to learn, then part of you know, one of the first places that we should look is what is the context that they're, the adult leadership in their house, parents or caregivers, what are they experiencing? What are they having to go through? Now, some of you might say, well, that's too much for what I have to do in my classroom. Well, at the bottom line is what we know is is that if young people are not able to learn or if they haven't been fed, and I have a, I have a quote towards the end of my comments um, from a teacher about the, the importance of young people being ready to learn. And so we can look at all of these things and understand that our, our job is to make sure that we understand what that outside context is so that then by the time they come into our classroom, there may be things that we can do in our classrooms that can mitigate some of those challenges that they're having at home. And so I'm sure that all of you are aware that some of the programs that speak specifically to what I'm talking about are things like free and reduced lunch. We know that there are tons of children that come to, to school on a Monday, like today, if we were in classrooms, that they would be coming to school with their last meal being whatever meal that they got from school on Friday, nothing over the weekend. And so 
those young people, it isn't that they don't have the ability or the desire to learn or to, to really achieve their dreams. If you're hungry, your stomach's growling, you haven't had anything to eat, you're gonna have an attitude, an attitude that maybe isn't perceived as positive. So we can't put the burden on them. We have to understand the situation and understand what it is that's going on. And so with social and emotional learning from the Cassell model, five key areas, if you weren't aware, then just quickly I'll review them. Self-awareness, you can see, the, see it in the model that's presented. Self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. The fact of the matter is that young people may very well be very socially aware, but also understanding that they're aware, that social awareness or self-awareness might actually be a, a detriment to them because they're seeing that there are plenty of young people who are coming to the class that, don't, that aren't suffering through the different conditions and contexts that they are. And so if that's the case, then we're asking them to be socially aware. They are being socially aware. They just don't have anything that they can do about the conditions that they're being placed in. And so that impacts then their ability to do the things that you're asking them to do to help them achieve their goals. And so though, that's the context that we have to be really mindful of because we're asking, we're, we're really looking at it and, 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 and I'm gonna drop this with you because this is really how I think about social and emotional learning. And the, the reality is we, social and emotional learning is an intervention because we haven't done enough to prevent the context with which young people come to learning environment. Let me say that again. Social and emotional learning is an intervention that is a result, a direct result of the lack of preventive measures taken to mitigate situations and circumstances that young people come to your learning environment around. Any time that we're working around committing resources to interventions, we're at the surface level. We're not going deep enough. We have to do the things necessary to prevent those types of conditions that we talked about on the outside. That's why the CARES Act is important. That's why funding educational programs is important. That's why to have a president, the first in the history of the United States, states state that we have to deal with white supremacy and, and racism and anti-racism um, and in, integrate anti-racism practices into everything that we do. That is prevention. Those types of things then don't mean that we don't have to put so many resources into things like social and emotional learning because we're putting them into fair housing. We're putting them into making sure that people are, are you know, young people are stable and they have stable living environments. Then they are going to be able to bloom and blossom like Bloom's taxonomy says, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs says, and I'll cover some of those pieces, how they're integrated in just a second. But when we're looking at this piece and talking about the need for social emotional, and social and emotional learning and life skills, like the life skills that you're teaching young people, it's to understand that we're coming on a, we're, we're on a surface piece of all of these underlying, we talk about underlying health conditions for, for the COVID context, but we're really talking about underlying conditions for that are public health and the public health crisis that is being under overlaid by the pandemic and all of the things that are being demonstrated to us in terms of the disparate treatments in, in many of the neighborhoods that you live and work and the disparate resources that many of the people who come out of the various communities that where you may be living and working and teaching, that those things then significantly impact everyone's ability to be able to learn. And if we don't do enough about those underlying things, then all of the things that we do on the surface are gonna just be that. They're gonna hit at surface things, but they're maybe not gonna to get to the needs that we talk about for young people to be able to recognize and manage their emotions. Well, I can manage my emotions, but I can't manage it if, if I'm hungry. I can't manage it if I don't have clean clothes to wear. 
I can't manage it if there's instability in when I leave, I don't know if I'm going to be living in coming out of a car or if I'm going to be living in a place to where I'm going to be evicted soon and I hear my parents talking about that. Those are the contexts that we're dealing with with the CARES Act, for example, and how we're extending the, the evictions and, and, and all of those and the types of resources that we're providing for folks. Those things are the underlying things that prevent success with social and emotional learning and with education. And so we have young people who can demonstrate caring and concern for others. You might mistake it that the fact that they're upset because they're having to care for an elderly relative, for example, that had to move in because of situations and contexts. Those types of situations and things make it very difficult for young people to establish positive relationships when they come to school. They're burnt out. They don't have any more to give. And kids shouldn't have to give that much. That's why, you know, so we've got to make sure that we're understanding the, the challenges that young people face and what you what the mission is that you all have in terms of your programs and the, and the mission that education has in terms of creating healthy partnerships. And so, you know, I have it on there. You all know what your mission is as CTE folks. Uh, but the piece that I put on there is kind of the, it comes from the update again from uh, Cassell and that SCL advances educational equity and excellence through authentic school family community partnerships to establish learning environments and experiences that feature trusting and collaborative relationships, rigorous and meaningful curriculum and instruction and ongoing evaluation. All of those pieces being rooted in the success for your, you know, the growth that you all are trying to achieve is rooted in the, this, this piece of this intervention that we're calling social and emotional learning and how we then can use some of those skills to help to mitigate the things that young people bring to the classroom to build the type of creative, healthy partnerships that we are talking about in education. And the bottom line here is the number one key element in this partnership is the partnership between you and that student and each individual student. Because one of the, one of the problems again with education is we're being overtaxed. Maybe we have too many students in our classrooms. So maybe we don't have all the time that we might want to spend to do all the things that we might want to do with young people. But for us to be able to advance and to work with them, we have to have models in place to be able to help them. And we also have, an, have to have an understanding of where they're coming from. And so all of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm not gonna go over that. Bloom's taxonomy and his revised taxonomy. The whole idea with me giving it to you is to just as a reminder that we're ultimately trying to get young people, whether it's CTE, math, reading, um, language learning, whatever it is, we're trying to get them to a new space, a space to where they're able to create something new. That means we're remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing. I toss in synthesizing because we want people to, young people to learn how to bring it all together, then evaluate and create. So I leave in that, that fifth element that Bloom took out some years ago. I say we leave that in because kids need to understand what synthesis is. They need to understand where they live and they understand it when we say that they're, we ask them to be socially aware they're understanding how they fit in the neighborhood context, for example. They're understanding the, the, either the abundance of resources or the lack of resources that they have in their communities. And the piece that I quote from the Honorable Mr. Mandela, I never lose, I either win or I learn. And that's a piece to where we are in terms of, you know, with our young people. We might think that we're losing because maybe we're thinking that we're not reaching them and that we're not really you know, tapping into their potential or they're not tapping into their potential. I don't believe that that's true. I believe that every child can learn and that you have an impact on young folks. But the reality is, is that sometimes your impact maybe may, might not be 
at the level of the, the mitigating issues that they're having to deal with outside the classroom. And so this, the bottom, bottom piece there says, you know, you have to mass low before you can bloom. And this comes from a teacher and it says, if my students aren't well fed, don't feel safe and are badly in need of hugs, they don't care where my questions land on blooms. We must meet their basic needs first. And so some of you might very well be sharing that sentiment. And so then let's look at some of the ways that we can help you to do some of those things. And before we get to that, I'm gonna stop right here and see if we have any questions in the chat. Hey Doc, we don't have any questions yet for all of you in the audience. I see 57 of you here. We're so happy to have you. I'm Dominique Murphy. I'm moderating this room today with Dr. Thomas. We wanna hear from you. If you feel up to it, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. If you're not feeling up for that, if you just wanna put a message in the chat, that will be very helpful. And I'll kick this one off, Doc. You know, going sure, off sure. of what you were saying, focusing on um, the student. If a student does not feel loved, if they feel like, you know, they're in a situation where maybe their parents are fighting and they don't have food and all these basic necessities for a child to feel safe. Um, yes. I know you're going to get into the specifics here in a second, but I, I, that's one thing I really want to focus on, the actionable steps. Um, my background myself, I grew up, my parents were both teachers and my mom dealt with this a lot where she worked with um, EBD, emotional behavior disorder, um, that sure. population. And one thing she found over and over again was that the kids were very smart. They were very willing to learn, but they were coming from environments where uh, they did not feel that love. They did not feel that security. They didn't have the food. So for her, uh, one thing that she did is she made it a mission to combat the issue. So she actually would go to Sam's Club and Costco and she would buy muffins in bulk and have orange juice and things like that in her classroom. Now her situation was her paying that out of her own pocket. It wasn't reimbursed. This was many years ago. So I want to kind of talk more about the actionable steps for someone out here listening saying, yeah, that's me. I have, you know, 10% of my class who comes in and they fit this demographic, but what can I really do? Because as we all know, if one student is cutting up in class, it disrupts the entire class. And so that, that, that's a great question, Dominique. And, and the context that you shared, unfortunately, that you shared about your, your mom and, and your dad as, instru as instructional leaders remains today. And so you know that, that is the unfortunate context that most teachers find themselves in to where they're underpaid. And then even with being underpaid are taking resources out of their own personal accounts and, and their family and personal responsibilities. And because they recognize the need in the classroom is so great. So what I would say is, is that there needs to be the partnership is this is about communities in our societies and our nation. And we have to have a greater responsibility, take greater responsibility for for bringing together resources. And so part of that is within within our cities, within your school districts, it's partnerships that you have and how do we extend those out so that you're working with some of the nonprofits, for example, in the area or working with some of the other um, family base and, and, and PT, PTAs and other um, parents and community organizations to, to bridge those gaps and, and break down the barriers, the, the infrastructure and red tape barriers in terms of liabilities and all of those things to actually meet the needs of young people. So that means that we have to form, you know, you know get the lawyers involved to, to remove those restrictions on, on sharing of resources so that, that, so that the need gets met and that then our young people are able to bloom. And so as a teacher, it becomes, you know, if you find the time in, in the midst of all of the other challenges that you have, then it becomes, making sure that if you're involved in what's the union doing? What is the union doing with, you know, with uh, these, these limited resources and helping to reduce some of the problems? What is the, the district leadership doing? What is the State Department of Education doing? And where are those resources? And, and it, one of the keys is just to find out what resources are available and 
where they're being distributed and dispersed. Because if you know that, then you can see, well, okay, what's the timeline? When are we going to get our ship? And so then, so then we can move beyond that to then start to plan to to implement the you know to to integrate those resources in so that then we can give young people hope for what you know the the things that they're dealing with that we can give parents hope for understanding the challenges that they're having to face and that you as teachers have hope then from your district and state and and, and national leaders to say that here's how we are addressing these things. And so this is something that, that I'm looking forward to with a new administration coming in with, with whatever changes are gonna be coming and, and really looking at all of these resources and saying, how can we build partnerships? There are plenty of nonprofits out there that, you know, that, that work with our school districts in terms of some of their after school and before school programs and summer learning programs and all of those things. Well, the context needs to change. The context needs to change now so that we make sure that these basic, you know, these Maslowian needs are being met so that then young people can then feel safe and secure. They can then socialize and, and, and practice building good relationships and then, you know, then get to that place to where they have a, a much better self-esteem and then also being able to self-actualize and actually receive the, the learning and skill building things that are coming from the educators that, that are wanting to build great partnerships and great relationships with them. And Doc, we have a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Sure. Um, people are saying the same thing, Lisa, Nye, and Chef Shelley. They want to know how do they do this in a virtual setting? Mm -hmm. This, the, the first piece in the virtual piece is, is the relationship building. And how do we demonstrate to young people that we understand their context, not the, the global context, because they don't care about the global context. They know about what their context is. And so as a as and it, it and unfortunately, the, the greatest resource that you all have as educators, not fortunate, fortunately, the greatest resource that you have is time. But unfortunately, there are so many things put, you know, being um, uh, pressed upon you in terms of your time. And so it takes time in this context, especially to be able to get to know where kids are coming from, what they're dealing with, all of those things that it takes time. And so, so, you know, what I say at this time, and believe me, education is central. I understand it. But at this time, in this context that we're in around the world, it's about the social awareness and making sure that we build those positive relationships with young people, especially because, you know, most of us, we're, we're getting up, we're, you know, even though we're working from home and all those things, we, our bank account is still being met, we're still getting the check, we're still, but understanding where young people are coming from and taking the time to really get to know them and then to be able to then offer some context that says, this is temporary. It's temporary. It's not going to be the same. You know, we have to make sure that we're following all the guidelines. We have to make sure that even as young people that we're promoting, whether it's the vaccine or, or whatever it is in terms of improving our family's health, our fitness levels, getting, getting our grandparents and our uncles and aunties and taking them walking, taking them on the walk, young people understanding as teachers that you have to make sure you're being that you're taking care of yourself that your health is 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 well and that you're able to have healthy connections with your young people because you've got things that are pretty stable in your own life next question doc how can you deal with s Ooh, just jump how can you deal with SEL with virtual learning? Okay, yeah, we answered that. And addressing some of the challenges families and students might have, but difficult to know without seeing them daily, which you touched on. Is there anything else you wanna to add to that? Yeah, the, the, the other thing is, is you're not alone. You're, as teachers, you're not the only ones. So find out who else is available, who else is available to the young people. What are some of the other social services that are available to young people? 
So, so that you don't think that you're the only one because you're not. You can't be the Lone Ranger. The problem is much bigger than all of us. And so it takes a collective effort. And so what I would say to that question, and I thank you for that question, um, is to understand that we are all human. We have, we have within us limited resources. We have lots of challenges on us. And then we also have this great responsibility of passing on our knowledge and, and skills and things to young people. But the reality is, is that there is only 100% of us. And so we've got to understand that and not put unrealistic expectations on each of us as learners and as educate instructional leaders. Um, you can't do it all by yourself. That, that's why you know, we're having sessions like this. That's why we're having it in groups so that we can express these things because you know, I, I can guarantee you that whoever that one person was that asked that question, that there's probably 15 or, or 30 or 40 more people that have a similar question. Everybody wants to be helpful. Everybody wants to meet the challenge. Unfortunately, we only have what we have. And so that's why it takes partnerships. And that's why it takes getting to know what the resources are that are available, not only for our young people, for you as well, so that you replenish, because we know also that when there's tough challenges like this, that teachers burn out. And so we want to avoid those types of contexts as well, because you know the first piece is having it in your heart, a heart to want to be able to do good and to be of service. And so you know if you, if you tap out for yourself, then more than likely that's gonna mean that one or more young people aren't gonna be able to benefit off of the work that you all do. Lots of great information coming. I wanna reset the room for all of you here. I know a few of you joined in after we started. This is social and emotional learning. We are here to help CTE students excel inside and outside of the classroom. I'm joined by the dynamic Dr. Dwayne Thomas, who is an industry expert in this field, specifically on social and emotional learning. So I'm honored to have him on this panel today. Uh, we're taking your questions for any of you out there who are um, curious about anything at all pertaining to CTE and emotional learning and how you can implement that in your schools and in your classrooms, please either unmute yourself when there's a pause or if you wanna write it in the comments, that would be great. We've heard from several of you already. That last question came from Kenrick. So thank you for that. Up next, we have Ro Rohan, Rowan, I apologize if I messed that up. I believe it's Rowan. And uh, they want to know, this, uh, they said, while I agree with the need to integrate SEL in all subject area, it must still have its unique place within the student's schedule to offer them a safe space for individual and group dialogue. Doc? Yeah, um, and tell me the name again. Rowan. 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 Um, and so, so I appreciate that question and, and you're absolutely right because that, that fits with what I just said earlier in terms of SEL is an intervention. And so we do have to, to schedule that for those folks who need that. The other thing is to remember that not all young people are at the same place around social and emotional learning. Some folks come where they have resources at home. So they're coming to your learning environment and they're not have, facing a lot of those same challenges. And so the reality is that it can't be a one size fits all. And so I agree with, with what Rowan said and think that especially for those folks who need it, that means that we, that we have to find out and have measures in place. And after this question, I'll go, go forward some more with some of my comments because the questions are starting to hit on some of the things that, that I have uh, some comments about. And so just just like Rowan's question, we can look at it and say, yes, the research tells us that if we're going to implement social emotional learning, it is not a one size fits all. It is that we have to be have measures in place to actually look at what what young people are experiencing and how we align what they're doing and the approaches that we're trying to take and have measures in place to evaluate our efforts. And so I think that speaks to what Rowan was asking about. And so, and then it becomes, you know, are we presenting these things in a, and cultivating culturally responsive leaders, learners, and a learning setting? Well, if part of that, if part of it is, is that we have these great expectations for young people who come to our learning settings, and we are not taking the time to get to know who they are, then we are not going to be meeting their needs. 
And therefore, then they are not going to be able to meet the needs that you might want for them to be able to help them with, with their careers and with technical education. And so we also have the responsibility of even within a storm, even within a storm to create a growth mindset. And so how do we do that? We, we're being responsible for transforming leaders, learners, and the learning environment in the worst, one of the, probably the worst context that the world has ever known right now. That's what we're living in with a global pandemic and, and greater strains coming. So we don't even know what the, how long we're going to be in this context. Because just think, just think as think of it as a kid, all of you educators out there, think of this as a kid. You just heard that the government finally get to the place that we said we have the vaccines. That's going to help us to come back out into the world and, and try to reach quote unquote normalcy. And then what's happened over the last two weeks? Well, maybe the vaccine's not going to work. Just imagine you're a kid. And you've been shut down, locked in. And even as you, as you as adults, shut down, locked in, thinking, I have this expectation. OK, I've been shut down for 12 months almost. Three more months. Get the vaccine ready to go. And now we know that there are strains that are coming that, that are resistant to, to the vaccine and, and new information. And just imagine a young person hearing all of these things. You want to talk about fatigue, you know, there's a reason, for example, that other countries shut down their entire school system and just said, focus on family. There's a reason that they did that. It's around social emotional learning. It was to take preventive action and instead of putting problems on top of where we are. And, you know, our educational system, no educational system is perfect. The reality is, you know, we're, we have to, our economy is dependent. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm so fortunate that, that we are, you know, in this time of this storm, we're learning, the, the country is really learning the importance of public education. We're really learning the importance of public education because without public education, just, just imagine where these young people would be if you weren't taking the efforts to do all of the things virtually that you were doing. Imagine where they would be just sitting at home in, in a context that might be you know, completely unhealthy for them. But every day they get to come and or every other day, whatever your schedule is, they get to come to the computer if they have a computer and if they have the internet, then they get to come to, to see your bright smiling faces and to be able to engage with somebody who demonstrates that they care for them. That's the integration, that's what we're talking about. And I think that that also speaks to Rowan's point with his question is that without all of you, where would we be? That's not a context that I wanna think about because the reality is the, you know, we are at a place in the midst of this storm like no other storm to be able to demonstrate the importance of educators like all of you and the important, the necessity for you to, to do, whether it's two days, three days, whatever it is, or one day, if you only have one day to, that one day might be that day that changes that young person's mindset. And without that one day, if they are looking forward to it, they, they might complain about burnout or complain about having to be on the computer. I would complain too, because I love interacting with people. That's who we are as human beings. We want to engage with people. We have to, that's part of our makeup. And so we're in this context. And so we have to explain to young people that this is temporary, even though we don't know when the, the light at the end of the tunnel is gonna come, we see it out there and we just have to keep that in their minds that even in the midst of the storm, they can learn. In the midst of the storm, we can learn. In the midst of the storm, we can be partners with young people. We can partner with their family with in this whole context that we've never been before to achieve some of our goals. And so I'm gonna move beyond these. Well, I'll cover some of these pieces really quickly in terms of the approaches to SEL. 
And, and hopefully this will help to answer some of the questions that some of the folks out there have as well. And so the idea is with is to, you know, whether we're teaching explicit social emotional learning skills instruction, or like we're doing today, teacher instructional practices to help you to then translate some of those things into your, transfer some of those things into your classroom. And then there's short-term outcomes and behavioral or academic outcomes. You may have heard these before, but if you haven't, some of the short-term outcomes is of course, we want them to acquire the skills necessary. We want to give them some, some opportunity and strategies for changing their behaviors and changing their attitude, which comes first before changing individual behavior. And then that individual behavior then might change it when they interact with some of the groups that, that we're hoping that they get back to really soon. And then a short-term pieces is enhanced learning environment. That's the whole idea, whether it's a, you know, hopefully to make it a supportive, engaging, and participatory learning environment. Well, we know that it's tough in the virtual space, but the more that you can have small groups, the more that you can engage, you know, have the young people interacting with their, with their classmates, the better it is for them. And then, you know, when we start to think about it in terms of behavioral and academic outcomes, then we're hoping that all of these things that we do have not, not only a positive social behavior, but also fewer conduct problems, less emotional distress, and improved academic performance. And one of the things that I want to share with you around the, the stress pieces, as best you can, have the focus not be just on how you respond to stress, but increasing eustress, and that's E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -S, eustress. Focus on the positive. How do we help young people to celebrate that they're coming through this, this context and the challenges that they're facing? How do we make sure that they are feeling safe? And, and, that, and you can see on the bottom of the screen there that effective SEL approaches often incorporate four elements that are highlighted by the acronym SAFE, S-A-F-E. So sequenced, active, focused, and explicit. And so sequence connected and coordinated activities to foster skill development. Well, remember, we're focusing on you stress, the good stress that comes from learning, the good stress that comes from having active forms of learning to help students master new skills, not distress, you stress, and that they're focused. It's some com a component that emphasizes developing personal and social skills. That's the basic root of SCL. And so, and then explicit. Another word there is target intentional. And so sp targeting specific social and emotional skills that, you know, that maybe, you know, maybe it's, it, it is social awareness that, that the young person is having some difficulty around. Before you go at trying to change their behavior, ask a question about their personal context. How are they doing today? What are some of the challenges that they're facing? If you ask those questions and you ask those in a trusting way, then they will then share with you, hopefully share with you, and you will be able to enlighten them and to be able to help them to change some of their things. And so, so I'm, I'm gonna take a pause again, Dominique, and see if we yeah, have- Yeah, I any actually said something, there's a great follow up there. You said act, uh, or just, you said ask in a trusting way. Uh, there yeah. were questions that came down a little bit earlier, one from Jennifer, the other one is a follow-up, uh, kind of a piggyback on that from Tanola. And they're asking, um, in terms of that ask, a lot of these children may not feel comfortable opening up in front a, of a large group A, or if they are doing the virtual learning, if they're home, they might not be comfortable uh, because there are you know, family members, et cetera, around. So how can a child or a teenager, you know, 18 under, how can someone in this situation feel comfortable enough to open up? Do you have any suggestions or advice, especially if they're home and they're like, I don't want my mom to hear me, but yeah. I want to be honest and open, but I, I, I'm not comfortable. How do they do that? Well, the, the first is being mindful that, that we have accountability issues that we have to be, you know, responsible to. And so 
That means using the official mechanisms that we have. And so young people all know how to use their emails. Um, and so that's something that can be sent in private um, directly to the instructional leader and the person that their coach or whoever they have a, a positive relationship with. Um, but the first preference uh, preference there is that they have to have a trusting relationship with you as the instructional leader. And so that means getting to know what their needs are again, and then, you know, listening and providing a space for them to be able to share. And so um, if the school has a, a hotline or something to where, you know, for the counseling or, or social services or, or the, um, any of these, you know, those school professionals, that then they could share their things. And maybe some people, there, there needs to be a way to share things confidentially. Um, and so without even, to, we, we have to get, get to the place to where we have systems in place to where young people can, are safe and they feel safe and they're able to, to share those things. And so whatever it is, if it's email, um, if it's a school number, that goes you know, to a counselor um, and it's some, where you're working with that counselor um, and so that the young person feels safe enough to share then doing that. We understand that there's, there's limitations on, on this sharing and the ways that young people can share. Um, and so it just becomes, what do we have available and making sure that the young person knows that it is accessible to them. Megan tapped into that and she said that Google form questionnaires are really great as well. Um, and she's made a resource list that she put into the comments. So the Google form questionnaire. Uh, another thing you might wanna look into, Clubhouse is a new platform. Uh, it is right now invitation only by iPhone, but it's going to be opening up in March and it's a really great platform. I got pulled onto it, um, gosh, maybe a week and a half ago. And I'm really seeing the value in there. You can create, uh, clubs, if you will, where it's essentially like a classroom. Um, you can also do one-on-ones where I can just hop on just like a phone call, but it's much more private um, and more encrypted. So it's very secure. So you can jump in a room with a student on this platform, have a quick conversation and then, and then leave. And the good thing about Clubhouse, if you're looking for more resources and things like that, kids love technology, they love social media. This is the, the new app, if you will. Um, there's a lot of professionals on this app. So this might be another thing to look into if we're going away from the Google document questionnaire and looking for more of a solution that the kids might find more hip and cool. So that's another uh, possibility to look into. Again, it's called Clubhouse. It's an app that's on the iPhone right now, but in March, it's going to be opening up to the masses. You know, uh, you know that, that's, that, that uh, you know, just put something in my head, Dominique. Um, that's one of the challenges that we have in things like this is that um, those a resource like that is great, absolutely. But typically you'll find that most of those kids who are having some of those other problems don't have that, an iPhone or don't have a, a cell phone, don't have that type of capability. And so what I would also share with all of our educators out there is, is to you know, before we share something that we think is is a great resources that we're aware of what, because that sharing that for those people who don't have it adds to a burden that they might be feeling. And so we don't want to limit the use of that type of great resource. But again, it means that we have to understand the context that the people who, that we're working with, if they don't have those types of resources available or if they have limited minutes, for example, then one of the last things that they're wanting to do is share something, you know, personally with some of our school leaders or something. So, so it really becomes, you know, making resources available that um, that speak to the conditions that all of the young people come with. That's that's great advice. Let's talk about the disconnect. Uh, a question came up here about. Uh, I'll just read it. Extremely frustrating that we cannot even ask our students to have their cameras on. Very yeah. alienating. Some will not or cannot even use their microphones. Yeah. Students are so used to bonding and building relationships with their teachers and school staff in person. I think yeah. the challenge is being presented to all of us on all fronts. 
there there's absolutely no doubt that that question is spot on and that should that educators instructional leaders around the country are dealing with that context i mean um, i'm in the greater boston area and i do significant work with the boston public school district and um, they've got 57,000 kids you know obviously unlike new york city that has over 200,000 in their school district and just imagine trying to get internet service, computers, computers that have, you know, that really don't have the bandwidth to be able to manage the, the Zoom and, and, and all of the other online services that are, are being provided. What this shows us is what, we, what I spoke about earlier is the disparities out there. Hopefully after we're coming through this context, we don't have those issues again. We have brought some things more, made things much more equitable. And we have, you know, all of these services that are being provided free now in terms of free internet um, and free uh, online services from, you know, the service providers, um, that those things continue. And uh, because the need is that great. And until we actually remove some of those disparities, we're, we're going to be continuing to be faced with those challenges. And so, um, so I feel that question, I, I, I understand where it, its context and where it's coming from. And our reality is that we've got to do better. And we've got to do better in terms of building the partnerships that we've, start, that we've started and have built in response to this COVID context. But the, again, that context was overlaid on top of the public health crisis of systemic issues that have to be addressed. And when we address those, then we don't need as many interventions like SEO. Okay. Well, we have less than 15 minutes before this session wraps up. So yeah. Dr. Dr. Thomas, if you want to add any more, I know you have some more slides to get to here and then we'll, we'll finish it out with a few questions. Well, I, I just want to share a couple more because I, I, I don't ever want to leave our teachers without in terms of resources. And so some of the things that I believe th these are some things that can help them to achieve their goals. And I'll, I'll move through some of them quickly because I only want to highlight a few of these and then leave some time for more great questions because I'd much rather answer questions than, than to be preaching to a choir that uh, is really doing the work out there. And so, so, you know, just quickly, some of the research on teaching, and some of you may have heard these things, but just a couple of things, um, you know, to reach your goals, teach and model the skills, um, build positive relationships. That's what we've been talking about. Foster healthy communication, even if a young person doesn't turn on their screen, doesn't, you know, turn on their microphone, they can still hear you. And hearing your voice might be the thing that changes their attitudes and changes their behaviors. And so having, and then having positive relationships with them and helping to develop self-efficacy, helping these young people to find small successes, even in the midst of a storm. How do you help them, even in this context of where they're, they may be struggling with all of these things that are going on? They're in, you know, for all of you, they're in high school primarily. And so they're, they're how do they, surround themselves with people who can help them to succeed. So that's why your voice is important. That's why even, you know, even if you're only there for one day, that's why it's important that they get to hear from you because they might not be hearing from anybody else. And so if you then are the only person that connects them to a reality that's different than their own, then it's vitally important that you not quit even in the face of them not turning on their camera or not turning on or not responding to your questions. The fact of the matter is that we can still hear even when we're not trying to engage in, in ways that we might want or are agreeable to us. And then, you know, um, as you're, for those that do turn on their screen or, 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 or that don't, in any kind of way that you can engage with them and interact with them in a way that says, how are, how, how are you getting some type of feedback Back, back from them with them. And so whether, you know, looking at these things in terms of teaching self-efficacy, are they able to master the experiences that you're actually having them to do? 
Are they able to get some secondhand experience? Our kids, you know, you know, they need to be out and, and with all of your stuff, it, it, it's working and, and using their hands and then getting some of that experience. Um, like, like I said, verbal persuasion, even if they don't turn on their thing, we don't know what they're hearing, but we know what they need to hear. And so that means then for the time that you have continuing to share those things and how you can then begin to help them to create that positive mindset, that positive thinking, that gross mindset. And then one of those ways is through culturally responsive learning. And you know, some of these may be points that you all are all aware of already, um, but just a couple of things I wanted to touch on. Culturally responsive teachers include student culture in all aspects of learning. Well, you can't include their culture if you don't know who they are. And if they're maybe even if they're bringing some things in that um, they don't know as much about their culture as you know because they they live in the in the little bubbles and and things that that they live and so. But I put on here this manifests itself through high expectations, effective communication, and a bias-free perspective towards students' differences. In this context that we're living in and operating in, it is. So it, it's almost impossible to be bias free. We can have a bias towards the fact that, you know, that our schools are underfunded. We could have a bias towards the fact that I'm having to go and teach into in a community that maybe I don't want to be teaching and, and working in. We could have a bias and I don't want to be teaching in this virtual context. Um, the, some of these things were, were forced on us and tossed on us and we have to respond to them. And so, we can look at it and say, you know, I have them here as well. Cultural empowerment fostered through teachers and school leaders is, is able to create a growth mindset within each child. And so, you know, I, I have some other pieces about um, teaching and how and, and, and some of the things that, you know, teachers are responsible for um, and needing to uh, the needs of an increasingly, understand the needs of an increasingly diverse population, adapting their teaching techniques to multicultural learners. We obviously are in the context where that has to happen. Um, being aware of personal beliefs and biases and, and how those then, um, and those same things concerning their students. And so if we come with some of the challenges, how do we change our perspective if young people are giving us the, the blank screen and, and not able to see beyond the barriers that are blocking them, how do we change their perspective so that they can see out of the, the pains and open up their minds? Some of you may be familiar with what's called mind viruses. Well, we're, we're dealing with this context of this global context and the virus that we're having to deal with, but the, the most, uh, egregious and, and, and dangerous is mind viruses and what's going on in our heads and what's going on in the young people's heads. And so I'm going to end it there. The, uh, the last few pieces, I really just want to close out with <clears throat> this, this last piece. And, and I found this quote, and I think that it speaks particularly to where we are today and in understanding the environment that we're in. And it says, when a flower does not bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So if you think about young people as a flower, so if a young person does not bloom, you fix the environment in which that young person is being forced to grow, not the young person. That's where SCL is coming in. You know, it's an intervention that we're having to use and that it's necessary because some of these things in their environment are things that are out of their control and out of your control and out of even the districts and some of the school leaders, state leaders control. And so that's where our government is having to step in. And every kid can learn. If we adults give them hope and create an environment that is responsive to needs and conducive for learning. And so it's been, you know, I, we still have just a few more minutes. And if there are other questions out there, then let's end it with some, some responses to questions, Dominique. Sure, 
there, Doc. Everyone is loving, <clears throat> excuse me, this metaphor that you have here. They're saying it's great, great point, absolutely. So this is resonating with a lot of folks, for great. sure. Uh, there was one comment that was made, and I think you did touch on this, but it's focused on New York City having 1.1 million students. Yep. And the activity in New York is really spotty because everybody right now is using their devices pretty much 24 seven, but especially right. that five time frame. So right. do you have any um, advice hmm. to anyone in this situation who's saying, hey, listen, I have these students, but you know, it's buffering, I can't hear them because of all the people utilizing this resource at the same time. Uh, I wish I did. I wish I could say, you know, uh, Mr. Mayor or Mrs. Mayor, I, I don't know who the mayor of New York is right now, but the reality is, is that our resources are being taxed at a level that we've never faced and because of we're in conditions that we've never faced before. And so instead of, so, so what I would suggest to people is recognizing the context, do the best that you can, get the best that you can out of this situation because until we're able to really address some of those systemic things, those are going to be the types of challenges that we have to face. And so, the only thing that we can do about that is change our attitude about it and just know that, you know, we're, we're doing the best that we can. You all are, are human and doing yeoman's work out there. And so the way that you keep that going isn't to focus on what you don't have, but focus on what you do and how the young people are able to utilize it as best they can, but also understanding that their responses to you aren't about their capabilities it's about the capacities that they have. And so when we start focusing on those capacities, then they can actually increase their capabilities and demonstrate to you that they're actually really wanting to engage. Because if you're frustrated about these things, just imagine how frustrating it is for a kid to be living in this kind of context and have absolutely no control over those things and wanting and desiring to demonstrate their aptitude and they're not able to do it. So focus on what you have, what they're able to give to you, um, however they're able to demonstrate to you that they are learning and that they are, are receiving what you're sharing uh, and then and take, take, uh, take honor and, and, and take um, energy from the fact that they are out there, they are desiring to, to learn from you and receive from you. They might just not have the ability or capacity to be able to do it. We are adjusting to this new normal and it's a new normal for all of us. So uh, I appreciate Dr. Thomas, you being here. You have provided so much insight to our panel, to our audience today. Uh, I just wanna <clears throat> spotlight you for a second. The comments are rolling in saying, thank sure. you. I got so much information, <clears throat> excuse me guys, very informative. Um, <clears throat> they are loving you. So uh, thank you for, bringing all this information to us. I know this 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 recording is this uh, video rather, this session is being recorded. So I'm sure it'll be made available. And I also linked Dr. Thomas's LinkedIn profile up above in the comments. So be sure to find him on there. If you have any follow-up questions at all, or if you wanna even work with him, he is a phenomenal resource in this space. Laura. Thank you, Dominique, I appreciate it. Just want to thank you, Dr. Thomas, and to you, Dominique. This has been a fantastic session, really important framing for what so many of our teachers are dealing with as they work with their students. And thank you to our teachers for all the great comments that you had in the chat and you shared with us. It just uh, really got my uh, thoughts moving and a uh, very important discussion we're having. Well, uh, the, one of the last things I'd like to share is, so Laura, thank you very much for making this opportunity available to Dominique and I. And, uh, and please do um, have any of the teachers who are you know, under the sound of my voice or even uh, when they hear the recording, reach out because um, one of the things that I know and we all know and we've talked about today is about limited resources. And so if you have some things and you just wanna bounce some things, shoot me an email, I'll get to it. It might be three o'clock in the morning, but I will get to it. And um, because it is important that we keep re-energizing all of you instructional leaders because we know how important you are. Okay, good. And Amarilla, so we send the link when we uh, send our follow-up information. Sure.
Very good. I think we are at time. Um, uh, next sessions are at 11. If anyone wants to <laughs> shout out any last questions, I'll uh, le uh, leave, uh, leave us open for a few more minutes. Any other questions out there? Um, real quick, Laura, there's a comment here from uh, Amaryllis saying the New York City resources link will not open when it's being shared. So yeah, I think it's the link from my our, our uh, teacher, Megan Latavish, okay. who is always a superstar with uh, gathering resources. Just looking up for you know, where that link is. And we want to thank you all for being here. I just want to commend each and every one of you. Um, I have just a love and admiration for what you guys do for any educator in this space. Like I said, my my parents are both educators. Uh, my dad's a former. He's now out, he's retired. But uh, just major respect. I know you guys are dealing with so much in this pandemic, and you've had to just you know, become miracle workers overnight. So if you don't hear it often, and I know you probably don't, um, just know that you have a fan from afar saying great work and keep it up. And, you know, you guys are needed. Teachers are the backbone of the world. And I have so much respect for what you all do. And I'm cheering you all on. <laughs> oh, thank you, guys. Now, Laura, do you want us to stay here or should we... Oh, let's see, I, uh, I just see two messages at the bottom. No, I think you guys are set. I think you should be getting a separate link, as far as I know, for your next session. Great. So we'll be back at 1030, Dominique? Uh, we'll be back at what, what 11, 11 o'clock Eastern. Well, the session starts at 11, right? Yes, yeah, so we'll be back in about 12 minutes. Uh, yes, and is this, is this the link that you have for this uh, session? Uh, let me see. I never. Yeah, let's make sure. I want to make sure you're set before we go. Let me um, ask my colleague. Let's see if it came while we were on the Zoom. Uh, no, I don't have anything from Jade. I have a few things from Don Trell. Would that be? Yeah, Don Trell. So if you have, um, Sorry about that, I got kicked out. Were you able to hear the session, Jim? Yeah, I, I got through the whole thing and then uh, as it ended, I got kicked off. Okay, I think for all of our guests who are still on, you should take a look to see what your session number two that starts at 11 is. There should be a separate link, so you'll probably log off and log back in. Yeah, Laura. And before we close, I'll give us a little time so that we can. Um, I have to log back in again. Uh, what's your session number two, Jim? I don't recall the number uh, three or four. Maybe I don't remember. All right. Let's see. One second here. Uh, Dominique, um, I'm going to check a. a um, a spreadsheet and I'm going to send you the uh, the info. Perfect. Because the one I have is from uh, Dan Trell. It came in at 730 last night, but I'm pretty yeah. sure that's the link I used to get into this room here that we're currently okay.